Right. Everyone's dropping in the chat where they're from, which is lovely. Um, I'm my name is Charlotte. I'm from the technician staff, and I'm uh, excited to introduce our moderator, Dr. Uh, Wendy uh, Sukir. Sukir. Sorry about that. Um, and she is the founder of the. Uh, Diversity Institution at Ryerson, among many other things. I'm going to throw it over to her. Um, hey, doctor. Great. Thanks so much and, and welcome, everybody. Uh, just before we get started, I wanted to uh, acknowledge that I'm calling in from Toronto, which is the traditional land of the Mississauga, the Anishinaabe, the uh, Haudenosaunee, and, uh, you know, we're all settlers. I see there are people from right across the country. All of you are on various uh, territories of Indigenous people. And one of the things that we always um, think is important is in addition to the land acknowledgement, thinking about what it means to us personally in terms of advancing reconciliation and at the Diversity Institute. Um, one of the things that we do is ensure that we have Indigenous researchers doing research, we partner with Indigenous organizations, and when we apply a gender and diversity lens to organizational practices, policies, and so on, we look specifically at implications for Indigenous peoples. Um, and finally, I guess the other thing that's important to us is recognizing that Indigenous peoples are themselves uh, very diverse and taking a distinctions approach. So it's, um, you know, a pleasure for me to have been invited to uh, facilitate this session with our distinguished panelists. And I will let them all uh, introduce themselves. Dr. Paulette Tremblay, uh, Kelly Lindsay, and Dennis uh, Kerrigan, who will all provide uh, their perspectives on the topic for today, which is looking at um, what the um, accelerated pace of digitization means in terms of Indigenous peoples, skills and employment, and more importantly, what successful um, and effective practices have been uh, developed and can be scaled and replicated in order to ensure that post-COVID we're not accelerating uh, the digital divide as opposed to ameliorating it. And one of the things that the research shows really quick, really clearly, and we just did a study with, um, uh, we did a couple, one with the Canadian Council of Aboriginal Business and another with uh, Environics where we oversampled with um, Indigenous communities. And Kelly was part of the expert panel that, that looked at that. One of the things we know about COVID is it's made everything worse. So where there was inequality before, it's worse. And when we recognize that 50% of Indigenous peoples live typically in remote locations or in the North, um, where access to fundamental infrastructure like water and schools and transportation is often a challenge, access to the internet is even more of a challenge. And as we're seeing this transformation to digitization across sectors, as we're seeing shifts you know, for schooling to online and so on, what previously was a digital divide has become a digital chasm. So I think that um, this panel is very timely because we know that when we look at the future of work, uh, there's no question that digital skills are increasingly important. We know that regardless of the industry, the sector, the size of business, digitization is transforming uh, business models and, and the way organizations operate. So it's uh, thank you very much for te to Tech Nation for identifying this as a key issue. And thank you to the panelists for, uh, for um, agreeing to step in, <laughs> Kelly on remarkably short notice. Uh, so before we um, before we dive into some of the specifics, I wonder if everyone could just take a few minutes to provide your um, perspective, you know, your personal background, the experience you have, what your organization does, 
and what you, uh, the perspective that you bring to the, the conversation. And then we'll dig into some of the, the issues in, in more detail. And I wonder, Dr. Tremblay, if you could kick us off, please. Now, I thank you very much, Wendy. And uh, uh, I too would just like to acknowledge that here I'm in uh, Stittsville, uh, in, which is west end of Ottawa, and uh, I'm on the Algonquin Territory. And just acknowledge that that's where I am uh, speaking from today and all of the other territories that all our participants and speakers are from. And so I'm a Mohawk. Uh, from Six Nations of the Grand River Territory is where I have my band membership. I was born into the Turtle Clan and uh, take my responsibilities seriously in terms of learning culture and, and uh, ensuring that people are aware of who we are and, uh, uh, and, and identity is, is a key factor in that, uh, um, key factor in that uh, uh, picture. Um, and I, I, I'd like to say that uh, um, I grew up uh, in Tyendinaga uh, my, with my grandparents and a long, um, like a, an extended family. Um, and it is my father's reserve. He's a Mohawk. And so I'm a Mohawk on both sides. So um, um, it's, uh, it's interesting. Anyway, uh, it was a farming uh, background. We had gardens, we had pigs, we had, you know, it was very basic. But what we learned, um, my grandfather couldn't read or write. Uh, he uh, could speak the language, but they wouldn't teach us because if they we were taught and the superintendent on the reserve got wind of it, we would get in trouble. There would be a punishment because there were, the superintendent had so much control over our lives. So sadly, one of the losses that I have is my language. I, I do not speak Mohawk uh, fluently. I, I know some words. I find that's, uh, you know, uh, th that's a big chunk of me because you see your culture in pictures uh, uh, through the language. And I think that um, although you still have dreams uh, through the unseen world uh, uh, from your uh, blood culture, I find that what happens is uh, with the words, it, there's just a resin you, it resonates with you. And so when I go to a longhouse uh, ceremony, I, I can't really understand, but it doesn't matter. I feel like I belong there. I feel like I'm being comforted and held close. So um, it, it's, it's a feeling and it's a belongingness. Um, and so I, I relate um, strongly to my foundation and my roots and and my culture and when my grandpa took us out hunting or fishing you know he would say the prayers uh, in the language and so we we understood that uh, we only took what we needed and then gave back and so this is you know and then the, the life on reserve uh, you're living you know, you don't know you're poor, even though you get your clothes uh, down two roads uh, from a building and uh, you buy used clothing and you remake it. My grandmother was a seamstress, but you don't know that that's not where everybody shops. You just think that's normal because that's what you know in your environment. And so, um, so little things like that um, are huge differences in a, in a mainstream stream situation although there are places you can go buy used clothing but you know the difference we just didn't <laughs> so um, it was interesting um my experience um the uh, uh, a long history my first job was in the american navy um, I went down on the J Treaty on my Indian status, where it was recognized in the United States, and uh, uh, learned about uh, being organized. And uh, shockingly enough, my first, I wanted to be in air traffic control, and uh, all the tests put me in um, accounting. So I was in payroll. <laughs> so I started my first job in payroll. Can you believe it? Anyway, um, so I speeded up all I had. I have done um, um, all my steps in education. I have a PhD in uh, education from the University of Ottawa. Um, and I have uh, uh, all my degrees, uh, um, and there are three or four of them, are in education. 
and one is in sociology. And uh, I think that I've uh, been at various universities. Um, I have an honorary doctorate from Cape Breton University for the work that I've done there in business. And uh, being on the Purdy Crawford uh, chair, I was on, headed up their board for uh, a number of years. So I have lots of experience and my, my I have lots of senior experience in administration. I, I am, um, I came from the Assembly First Nations where I worked there uh, two, four, five years, uh, about 20 years ago, and then just completed another five years. So I'm very, very uh, knowledgeable uh, on issues coming out from uh, Assembly of First Nations and the National Chiefs Closing the Gap platform. And they're all relevant because the federal government took them and ran with them. And uh, many of the pieces of legislation we have been able, uh, Assembly First Nation was able to get through is just current. Um, and now learning how to implement and uh, implementation's huge because we don't know what that looks like. And we've never done it before, but we're learning how very quickly. Uh, so there's a lot of unknowns in the path that we're forging as we move forward in education and taking control of education because uh, it's, it's very seldom you get the help you need because the problem is the diversity. Everybody, every First Nations is unique. They have uh, 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 their own dialect in a language, they have their own customs, their own traditions, all of the ceremonies are different. And it's only based on community, but they're still different. What happens in Tyandinaga, what happens in Akwesasne, what happens in Six Nations, uh, Ganasadagi, Ganawagi, those are all Mohawk communities, but uh, they're different. And so there's some similarities. But that's what we have to understand. You can't move away from the diversity because it's just the it, the reality is that's what it's like on the spot. That's on this land. I learned these traditions, and uh, it was it was connected to nature, and this is how we do things. And we use nature uh, in every all our ceremonies to guide us. And so my perspective now that our vision statement at uh, my organization now is to you know balance uh, the Western culture with the mainstream, uh, the mainstream with the uh, indigenous. So uh, not so easy to do because each community is different. And so that's just a, 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 a standard way of being and we know that. We accept that First Nations people know that. And so, and, and the degree of it. And so now it's how do we learn to be self-determining. How do we decide? And we have to go to the people to do that because they're going to be the decision makers because they have to live with the results. So, so diversity, inclusivity is something we live and do in our lives on a regular basis. We just don't know that these terminologies are part of it. And so I think that starting from that perspective for me is the base of everything I'm going to be talking about and sharing today. Yahweh. You're muted, Wendy. Apologies, uh, Dennis. I was going to suggest Dennis go next and then. Sure. Thank you, Tansi, everyone, and thank you, uh, Paulette. Uh, my name is uh, Dennis Kerrigan, or si vous parlez le français, je m'appelle Denis Carignan. I go by many names across uh, the country. I'm a, a Cree person from the Pasco First Nation in Saskatchewan, Treaty 4. I'm speaking today from uh, North Regina uh, on the Niganit uh, First Nation Urban Reserve. Um, I work for a group of companies, uh, the flagship of which is Plato Testing, uh, created in 2015. Basically, it was created to bring uh, more Indigenous Canadians into the IT um, into IT based careers using software testing as a lever. Um, kind of a happy accident about his creation. I was on a, uh, a Governor General's Canadian Leadership Conference in 2015. Met an entrepreneur from New Brunswick. Um, I at that time was living in New Brunswick, and we had an idea about uh, creating a company that would bring uh, First Nation Inuit and Métis Canadians into careers in testing as a lever into uh, other careers in, in information technology. Um, so that idea happened on uh, June 9th or June 8th of 2015. The company became a reality in the fall of 2015. We just achieved our five-year anniversary 
Um, we have a training program that we developed in partnership with a college in New Brunswick um, that provides um, a way of bringing people with little to no technology training into uh, a position where they can actually work and be successful uh, as a software tester. And then uh, the way the software testing career path goes, your value increases as you gain years of employment. So uh, I'm happy to say that we now have uh, junior testers that are moving into becoming intermediate testers. We have testers that are moving into a field called test automation, which is a more advanced uh, testing set, skill set. And we also have uh, testers that are um, have moved on and are now working in other various corporations across Canada. And part of their career path has been through our training program and through our company as an employer. Um, we have a spin-off company in Saskatchewan. I see I've got Plato testing in the background, Plato SAS testing here on my shirt. And uh, the Plato SAS testing is a Plato branded company that's majority owned by 11 First Nations in Saskatchewan. And um, we are basically doing what we can to build an indigenous uh, quality assurance technique uh, software testing team across Canada. We've had uh, we've, uh, numbers right now are somewhere in the neighborhood of 50. We have paid out somewhere in the neighborhood of $8 million in salary to an all, all indigenous software testing team across Canada. And we're looking to be a company of a thousand one day um, indigenous testers across Canada. Thank you. Great. Hello folks. Kelly Lindsay, president and CEO of Indigenous Works. I'm speaking to you from Treaty 6 in the Métis homeland of Saskatchewan in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan today. Uh, Métis Creed, French roots on my mother's side, Polish and Ukrainian on my father, so we joke that we like bannock and pierogies together. I've uh, been a lucky Saskatchewan boy. Um, got a call yesterday from Wendy, would I step in onto this panel? What could I resist? Two, two amazing women. Uh, Wendy Coutier and Paulette Tremblay, who I've known for a very long time. And to Dennis, I've known Plato um, going back more than 12 years, helping your founding innovator start that company and, and really providing support and connections to the Indigenous back then, the Aboriginal workforce. So folks, um, our organization focuses on employment and workplace inclusion. How do we help employers develop the knowledge and strategies to be inclusive workplaces? We've been doing this work in employment and workplace strategies since 1998. There's some background noise, so we might have somebody's speaker might be on, maybe just go on mute. We, we've been doing this work since 1998, um, and we were came out of the Royal Commission on Aboriginal People. How many people remember this? 1996, there were 434 recommendations in the RCAP report, and we were one of them. And so it was uh, formulated in 97, 98 I was hired as the founding president and, and CEO. Um, and, you know, back prior to that, I spent a decade in lifeguard and aquatic and recreation manager. I was a lifeguard chairman for Canada. I got to see Canada and experience it, um, design programs. And in some ways, uh, the people that are all gathered here to talk about skills, in some ways, it is like lifeguarding. We're teaching people skills so they can survive, tread water and make a living and a, and a career for themselves. And And today... Careers and skills and this this topic of uh, that Tech Nation is advancing, it's it is about a skills agenda, and skills is something that Indigenous people have practiced for thousands of years. So instead of looking at this through a deficit agenda, I'm I'm hoping that in this panel we can talk about some of the assets, some of the forward thinking, and and some of the ancient wisdom that that Indigenous people have used to build skills for economies, for social inclusion child rearing, knowledge of ice flows, knowledge of genetics that predated Gregor Mendelssohn, and even going back to the Mayans who had developed and, and charted the stars that are within seconds of today's modern day atomic clocks. So we've had skills, we've had innovation, and I'm just so very pleased, Wendy, that you did reach out. And there's a lesson to everybody, just ask. You just never know uh, when and how people can step in. I'm really pleased to be part of today's panel. Let's turn it back to Wendy. Mute it again, Wendy. Lucky to have people with such complementary perspectives. So really the first question is when we think about skills um, from an employer perspective, and maybe um, maybe Kelly, you can you can kick this off and and Dennis and Paulette can, can jump in. But when you look at what you're hearing from employers, when you look at the impact of COVID, when you, 
you think about um, trends. Can you just talk a little bit about, about how you see uh, this impacting opportunities for Indigenous people and especially youth? Because we know that that's the, the large segment of the, uh, of the Indigenous population is, you've, you know, it's a very young and growing um, part of the workforce. Wendy, I think the, uh, in some ways, COVID has taught us all to work in the world of disruption. And it's here to stay. I mean, if you look ahead, there are now a number of reports. Wendy, you, the Diversity Institute has looked at some of this forecasting, the Royal Bank and others. 25% of Canadian jobs will be heavily, heavily disrupted by technology. 50% of the job profiles are going to change with an overhaul of skills. And our education, our labor market and employers are not ready. Maybe just go on mute there, Wendy. Just uh, there's a bit of background noise with the speaker. So I really like this forecasting. Is that uh, again, instead of looking backwards over our shoulders, I think we need to look forward to say, how do we position Indigenous youth, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit, to be ready and positioned for these jobs of the future? And then all Canadians, how are we accelerating? Our ability to leverage labor market information is quite poor. We're one of the worst in the G7 nation. So we, ne we need better labor market information. It's usually five years outdated. So again, I think this is an area where Tech Nation and others can play a leadership role. How do we revamp those systems? But what's the number one, everyone on this call today and this panel and this focus, Wendy, what's the number one most important skill that's gonna be needed by all Canadians, including Indigenous Canadians? It's digital fluency. And that does not mean, uh, Dennis, again, we need coders, but it doesn't mean just a whole bunch of coders. It's deeper than that. Digital fluency is going to be essential. In fact, digital uh, fluency and digital technologies was going to disrupt many of the jobs. So today, I think we are, and I hope we are looking at how do we actually ingrain this sense of digital fluency into uh, all education systems. That to me, Wendy, is where we need to start. It's funny you would, uh, you would raise that, Kelly, because one of the things that I think is so critical is I've spent 30 years trying to increase diversity in engineering and computer science. Really important. We need more Indigenous graduates in everything, but including computer science and engineering. However, the tendency to equate jobs in uh, digital uh, industries or ICT exclusively with engineering and computer science completely misses the point. Um, when we look, for example, at, at recent studies from the OECD that say employers want digital skills, um, and there was a study done in Ontario, only 10% we're talking about programming or Java stack development. About 15% we're talking about skills to use applications like SQL and SAP and things we can frankly teach people fairly quickly. 75% we're really just talking about what I would call digital fluency, which is you know the ability to use Microsoft Office and Excel and to understand how technology can support organizational objectives. So I think one of the things we have to start with, as you said, is understanding where the labor market is going and how with low code, no code, you know, the assumptions we often make about you needing a four-year degree to get a well-paying job in the sector are simply misdirected. I, Dennis, what's your perspective? Um, I think I agree with uh, your last comment there that the uh, you know the pursuit of a four-year degree or or whatever in computer science, although very important and very laudable, uh, isn't the only path to a career in technology. Um, what we do with our program is we teach the skills of being a professional software, and that's how to test software, but also how to interact with clients. Because if you can find all the bugs in the world, but you can't report that in a way that doesn't insult the person on the other end, your your value as a tester is is lessened. Um, when it comes to the fluency side of things, um, definitely uh, some comfort with uh, coding languages, and it can be anything from SQL, Python, HTML, up through to whatever. 
is is helpful in our business and it will help somebody advance quicker but it's not uh, an absolute necessity coming in uh, really what we're looking for are people who are able to learn so quite often you know the completion of a degree or diploma is a good indicator of a person's ability to learn and then you know what we're doing is we're teaching skills that are demanded by the marketplace and uh you know when it comes to sort of the first part of the question the impact of covid i mean much of what people need to succeed in this business they can get online and they can get for free through lynda.com or udemy or various uh, resources that are available um, so that can be done virtually from anywhere in the world where you've got a you know uh, a reliable high-speed internet or even a medium speed internet uh, connection um, what we try to do is to build the talent and then um, support that talent in through its first couple of years because that's really the most important thing if you look at our business the the value you know get in and become a junior tester you learn how to test um, but the important skill is to learn what to test and that comes through years of experience and support and coaching and mentorship from people that have been doing it for a while so our partnership model involves you know bringing indigenous canadians into through our training program um, and then we put them in groups usually if we can in groups of two on testing projects so that there's some ready-made support there and then we support those uh, individuals with a more senior resource from a partner company that we have that whose job it is to make sure that they're successful on their engagement because um, we believe that it's getting through that first couple of years to to let's say year three of being a tester and at that point you almost become autonomous because we can put you successfully on a project virtually anywhere thanks very much um dr trombley what would you add to that I see you nodding. You're on mute. Oh, sorry. I see you there instead of my name, and I don't know how to change it. And if I press something, I'll probably, it'll all go wonky. So I'm leaving it alone. I know my limitations. Anyway, um, a couple of things. I, I think that what's key are problem solving abilities. I think another key skill is uh, communication is absolutely critically essential. Uh, if you don't know how to communicate well, the problem is you're not going to get your message out. And, and part of that is making sure that what you, you're you saying is what people understand and that there's, a, a, you know, a harmony. But lots of times people will not know that and, and that causes that miscommunication causes a lot of problems. And so those are two key, you know, um, uh, areas where skills have to be developed. And I think that uh, um, I want to give two examples of uh, what communities have done. We have done, um, uh, I think, a series of uh, uh, seven town halls across the country with First Nations education administrators. And we were talking about what's happening because they oversee what happens in the schools with the principals and the teachers and the students and then the members of the community. And so you have to look Look at the classroom you have to look at the school the buses and the transportation all of those things in covid and so when we were asking them what kinds of things with this covid uh, did you find you needed well of course it was about digitization and connectivity and making sure many didn't have it most people don't have it connectivity to their homes that's number one but number two is there were some really wonderful examples where they're doing it really really well and one of the examples was in uh, Alberta with the uh, Stony Education Authority and what they did is they didn't have it but they just decided we're going to do it our own way we're just going to do what we have to do which is what our people do anyway I mean if, if you're in community and I was in band administration in my community at Six Nations and we just found that we just did what we had to do and we found ways to do it. And so Stony Education Authority, what they did, uh, uh, they banded together. They have um, four schools uh, and uh, that go from uh, different uh, grades, some from pre-kindergarten to uh, grade three or four, and some of them from uh, grade six to 12, and some of them from pre-kindergarten to 12. And they have a, a total of uh, 1,034 students and a staff of 183 that they're providing service to. So what they did is they said, virtual learning is going to be a key in this. And so they took the bull by the horns and created virtual learning. What they did was create the SEA remote learning model 
and they did video recordings of instructional pedagogy guided by Alberta education curricular outcomes. And number two, they did learning activities to develop students' knowledge of concepts and content, and then per, uh, did tasks through two uh, vehicles, the Google Classroom and the Google Meet. And then they had somebody internally who really understood uh, information technology and was the ed tech coach and provided support and assistance to uh, teachers, students, and even parents, because parents want to be in this picture. Kids come home tired and, and parents have to help. And if they have to help and the, and the young person's at home, educate that person, then well, and because there was lots of outbreaks of COVID all of the time, and you don't know when you're going to be shut down. And then the student is not learning again. And so what happens is, uh, uh, and they include it not only in their model, the mental health and well-being coach. So I think this is a, a best practice where people can learn to go and, and, and you know, uh, understand their processes. They un they're help happy to help, but it's ongoing communication and ongoing with this Google Meet. It, they did amazing things with it and uh, with communities, other communities. And I think that they've got a great uh, model uh, of a great best practice. The other place was in Quebec. It was called the First Nations Education Council. And in that First Nations Education Council, uh, they have 22 communities uh, from eight nations. There are 26 First Nations schools in 16 communities, and there are 4,600 students. Um, and then they list all of the uh, communities. Um, and I know that when, the, when they went there, uh, they have a technology services. The, so they started in 2007 and built their own system where they provide technology services such as connectivity, where they talk about the broadband services uh, for and fiber optic grade and deploying fiber optic connectivity infrastructure across all the public sectors in those communities and upgrading the um, optic engineering plans and then 100% wireless coverage on, at the schools and the operations that they do operations and main, maintenance they do licensing um, in Microsoft Education, Mac Macavi Antivirus, Smart Notebook, Zoom, Zulu Desk. I like that one. I don't know what that is. And then they have a bunch of skill <laughs> special projects like Use Skills Link and uh, iPad Management Service, IP Telephony, IP Camera, and a service. So they provide support for the school connectivity. And um, they uh, their partners is First Nations Infrastructure Fund, and Health Canada. And they also developed a techni technical guide for distance learning that they've shared with everybody. But they say what they have to do. Uh, they have to continue to support the training needs on an ongoing basis. And they have to establish a schedule to meet with schools and teachers on a regular basis. They have to leverage the use of the educational initiatives offered through Microsoft and Apple. So it's a constant uh, communication and working together. I, I think they were amazing models and uh, maybe Kelly and Dennis you know, might want to partner and look at them uh, uh, further. Thank you. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think you raise a really good point that if we don't invest upstream, we shouldn't be surprised that there aren't people um, coming downstream and equipped to take the jobs that are so in demand. So I think, um, you know, uh, Dennis has talked about um, his very innovative model, and I love it. It's, it's, you know, even though I work at a university, I think universities haven't changed a lot since the Middle Ages. And there are lots of new models that are actually bypassing traditional post-secondary institutions that create opportunities for people. Um, and Paulette's talked about um, what's going on in the school system. Kelly, what about where you sit? What, what innovative approaches have you seen that are worth um, tracking and, and replicating? I think um, I'm always interested in how can we connect industry into the classroom? So, you know, right in Dennis's backyard, Pasqua, um, that nation has a manufacturing plant. I think it's Pasqua. They have a manufacturing plant and they pivoted on COVID and they actually created, they, I think it's called the Bumblebee. It's, the, it's a plastic hub that goes over, over a desk a student's desk. 
they're now selling these internationally. To me, this idea of innovation, uh, and my question would be, just go on mute there, folks. Uh, my question would be, are they taking that technology, uh, that innovation, and bringing it into the classroom? Are the kids learning about their own Pasqua Nation and the fact that this company is doing some world-class innovation, uh, designing, developing a product? Are the kids learning about the difference of what messenger RNA is versus DNA? It's this very, very pragmatic, what's happening in the world today, um, what's happening with artificial intelligence tomorrow. This is where we need to be uh, pointed in terms of developing the partnerships between industry, developing it with educators, developing it with community organizations, many of the folks watching this session to say, how do we develop these collaborative education models uh, that do connect Indigenous youth to obviously to see the world of work? And uh, it doesn't really matter whether you're Indigenous or non-Indigenous. How do you expose all youth to the world of work? I think this is really the uh, wonderful opportunity of technology. I'm now seeing people put on a, a, a virtual reality glasses and they're able to see uh, how to operate a crane and do these things. And that's the gamification of careers. I don't care how we do it, I, but we got to do it in, in these ways that are certainly much more engaging, more stimulating, and really from a very, very pragmatic business and, and a public purview, it's about fit. How do we create a better fit? I estimate, and Paulette and Dennis, you know this from over the years, I've estimated that 25% of Indigenous people are not in the right career fit. I don't think we've done a good job of career planning, career fit. And today there are just are now emerging technologies and tools and assessments to really look at career fit. And why that's good is you should show almost like three strikes. You know, we're not going to train you in 10, 10, 10 different potential training programs, which we've done. I've got cousins that have gone through a dozen training programs. How do they lead to employment? And, and to me, this is Canada's great labor market question is, how are we integrating and aligning people with this idea of fit? because it does create productivity, not just, not just in terms of GDP and all this, but the happiness that someone experiences when they're in the right career, they're motivated. They, they, they get joy out of fixing, uh, you know, an airplane engine or orchestrating and delivering a great class at a university, whatever their career passions are. So to me, I think this is where career fit needs to play a, a key role going forward. I want to ask one quick hot pursuit question and then um, we'll have to go to wrap up. But unfortunately, the time has just flown. But in addition to equipping young people and older people for traditional jobs and careers, what's your view on entrepreneurship opportunities? Because that's where I thought you were going to go. And it sounds like uh -huh. Ado's a really good example of that. The research that we've done with CCAB has shown that in many Indigenous communities, uh, entrepreneurship is a way not just to um, encourage uh, economic development, but also community development and growth. Do, do you have views on entrepreneurship as a, as a pathway for Indigenous youth? Well, the, 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 first of all, the stats are Indigenous entrepreneurship is growing. Estimates are five to eight times faster than the mainstream economy. So give or take, it grows fast. That's because there's all has always been a spirit of entrepreneurship. It's uh, being accelerated. Uh, I would say our challenge in entrepreneurship, though, is scalability. How do we scale people to really be entrepreneurs uh, in larger scale operations? You see what the Mi'kmaq are doing with the purchase of Clearwater. Uh, now, this is a community economic development, just but really, I think the the uh, challenge of scale, being able to finance much larger scale operations and empower Indigenous people uh, and not just grow businesses, Wendy. I think there is an opportunity to be looking at uh, mergers with family-owned businesses. 79% of Canadian companies that are family-owned have no succession plan. And the, fat, the fit of values with Indigenous entrepreneurs, I think, could be a great fit. So I think there are some opportunities and some real opportunities for, for entrepreneurs to be good for Canada, be good for Indigenous people. I know you're really focused on the innovation agenda and, and merging those two sets of ideas. So 
I'm going to get fired as your moderator. We've got three minutes left. That's one minute each to to summarize your views on, you know, for the audience, what are things that they should be thinking about if they want to engage more with um, Indigenous youth and, and workers? Paula, let's start with you. Take yourself up. I think the first thing we have to do is look at the type of relationship we want to build. I think it has to be a long-term relationship with multiple uh, phases. With it, it has to be ongoing. The successes stories come from those kinds of relationships. And in business out of uh, Cape Breton University, where they take the students in engineering and, and, and uh, take them from a small, right through high, from high school, throughout and the same in in with paul martin and his entrepreneurship he gets right into the high school classroom and starts building them at that level so start young when the students are young in high school classrooms and start building them and build that relationship so that's i think one of the keys so i'll let it go with that I don't know if you said me, but I'll go next. Um, I think just building on what uh, Paulette said, I think something that we're discovering is really is building on successes. So uh, what we're trying to do is bring uh, a first cohort of uh, professional Indigenous software testers into the space. And what we've found and we are finding is that now we're getting sons, daughters, nieces, nephews, other relatives that see a possibility of succeeding in this space because someone they know went before them. Um, I can certainly point to my own experience with people that I knew that helped pave a way for me. And we're trying to build that into a business model uh, that does something from a private sector side that uh, we think is effective. The whole campaign, See It, Be It, focused on women entrepreneurs, including um, Indigenous women entrepreneurs. Last word to you, Kelly. Three things I would offer up, Wendy, is... Um, I think the, the first is we need more focus on research and innovation. And that's where Ryerson and the Diversity Institute have been real partners with our new initiative, Luminary. Um, we need to really research both the supply and the demand side challenges and barriers. We can't keep writing on the old myths and stereotypes that even we as Indigenous people use. Um, we need to sort of wake up and I think research can do that. Number two, to everyone that's listening, it's about make sure you get a partnership and engagement ready. This is on both sides. Again, Indigenous communities need to be partnership ready and engagement ready. So do NGOs and, and industry. And I think, I think thirdly, support Indigenous-led strategies, support Indigenous-led institutions. We need more of that. That's the same message from RCAP, and uh, we need your support to build those. Thank you so much, all of you, for uh, sharing your time today, especially you, Kelly, at the last minute. This was fantastic. I'm sure the audience enjoyed it. There will be follow-up and a uh, round of applause to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks up to everybody. Awesome. Thank you so much for this panel. It was excellent. Um, for everybody letting you know that uh, the next uh, panel is starting, so you just click on your sessions tab and you can join that group. Um, and if you, I know that um, Dennis dropped a, um, a link in the chat, so feel free to check that out as well. Yeah. Thanks, Ken. Yeah, Paulette and uh, Wendy, if you want to take a look at the link I dropped in the chat, uh, we with our training course, we uh, we did a nice video of uh, the last course that we offered in Calgary. So it gives impressions from from the students. It was paid for by Suncor and Deloitte, so their name was dropped heavily in it. But um, it gives you an idea of what we're trying to do. I learned so much. Thank you very much, Dennis. Thank you, Wendy. Thanks, folks. Thanks. See you, Kelly.